I, I was uh, pretty depressed today, but now I feel really good about myself after that introduction. If, if you're uh, old enough, lots of things happen. Um, I'm, I'm also mindful of the fact that I'm the only uh, thing between you and drinks and dinner, so I'm going to try to be uh, try to be brief. Um, I um, um, did some research. I, I, I had assumed that the institutions that you represent were very homogeneous in nature. But uh, over the last couple of days, as I've been pouring through the US News and World Report rankings, where they have descriptions of each of the institutions, uh, I, I found out that some of you have acceptance rates in the 25 to 30% range. Others have acceptance rates that are well over 75%. That the, the, the range of average salaries of full professors at your institutions uh, uh, is about $50,000. Uh, some of you have greater than 30% of your students who are Pell Grant recipients. Others of you are down below uh, 15%. Uh, so it, it's really a, a heterogeneous group. But just so you won't feel bad, those of you who are down uh, at, at the bottom, uh, I'm at the Ivy League institution uh, whose acceptance rates is more than double that of the three best uh, institutions. And I'm at the institution whose full professor salaries are $50,000 less than the uh, salaries of full professors at the top three uh, institutions. And I'm at the institution whose endowment is one-eighth on a per-student basis of that of, uh, of Princeton. So no matter what grouping you're in, there is lots of uh, heterogeneity. Um, and so I'm going to talk uh, today about is the golden age of selective private liberal arts colleges over? And, and some of you may think, well, well wait a minute, I, we have many more problems than you're, you're talking about. And I, I understand that. But hopefully, uh, as uh, during the, the time here, you will come up with sets of solutions to each of your institution's uh, problems. OK, so a little bit of background. I, I graduated in 1970. I received my PhD, the absolute best job market for faculty members in the history of the world. I had offers from over a dozen places. I, I was really happy. Uh, and then over the next decade, the, the salaries of faculty fell by about 25% in real terms. So, so much for my ability to predict the, uh, the future. But, what I, but I, what I wanna argue is that the last 40 or 45 years uh, really has been the golden age of selective private colleges and, and universities. Uh, increasingly, uh, uh, the, the students have become much more uh, concentrated. Uh, selective students and high achieving students have become much more concentrated our institutions. And it's just a pleasure to teach these bright eyed students uh, who are smarter than you are. Uh, our teaching loads uh, have, we, we complain, fact, we always complain, but our teaching loads typically are much lower than the teaching loads were of our predecessors. For those of us at research universities, federal funding has allowed us to conduct more research than we ever dreamed would be possible and to uh, conduct uh, uh, graduate education. And I, I've trained 45 uh, PhD students and I just smile uh, each time that I, uh, that I think of them. And uh, we, because of growing inequality in, in higher education, the faculty salaries at many of the selective institutions have soared out of sight relative to everybody else. So I, I, I want to claim that uh, teaching at these institutions has been a really great gig. And most of us, uh, I think, are, uh, are pretty, uh, are pretty uh, happy. But we are at a turning point, a very, sort of a, there's some very troubling things going on. And if you sort of turn to the external environment, institutions such as yours and mine are seen as part of the solution to our nation's uh, problems, that we no longer lead the world in terms of the share of our uh, young adults that have college degrees. And we are expected uh, to contribute to increasing uh, the education level of the population. And for those of us involved in research, we are expected to produce research that's going to lead to job creation and improvements in health and the environment. So in a sense, uh, the public understands and, uh, and the political process understands the impo important things that we do. But we're also seen as part of the uh, problems because of our ever-increasing tuition levels, uh, the increasing uh, debt levels which our students are emerging with, 
the small number of students with modest means that are attending many of our uh, institutions, and the, the uh, uh, low spending rates from our uh, endowments, and threats of different types of federal regulation loom, uh, whether it is to limit our ability to raise uh, tuition or to force us to spend more out of our endowments than we, uh, than we want to, or to limit the tax-free nature of the income uh, we earn on our endowments uh, and our property tax exemptions, or to limit the uh, ability of people when they make contributions to us to uh, deduct them uh, from uh, their income tax. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna basically claim we're doing a lot better than public uh, higher education is, uh, is doing. Um, and the continual decline in public uh, uh, higher education funding over the last 30 years has forced the public institutions, when they can, to raise tuition levels at much faster rates in percentage terms than our tuition rates have, uh, have uh, gone up. But in spite of that, the absolute cost disadvantage of the selective privates in both research universities and liberal arts colleges has, has continued to increase. Because if you start out with a tuition level of 30,000, and I start out with a tuition level of 10,000, and you increase your tuition by 5%, and I increase your t uh, my tuition by 10%, you've become more expensive in an absolute sense. So financially, uh, uh, it's becoming more expensive for students to attend your institution unless you dramatically increase financial aid. And I'm going to come back and, and talk about that. And then the other problem uh, is that the whole focus of public policymakers and the public on degrees that promise high earnings increases pressure on liberal arts institutions to defend the uh, value of liberal education. So what, what I want to do uh, uh, tonight is to sort of uh, start out by arguing that our financial models are breaking down, and I'm gonna give you the four reasons that I think they're uh, breaking down. Uh, and then I will sort of talk about them, uh, these reasons in a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, and finally, I will sort of conclude with some speculations about what institutions should and could be doing and what likely uh, uh, things people will be thinking about uh, in the future. And so the four reasons that our financial aid, uh, our financial models are breaking down. We've been increasing tuition at three to three and a half percent more than inflation for the last 30 years, but economic and political forces may limit our ability to raise tuition as rapidly in the future. Uh, the, the president, I, I was at a, uh, a nonprofit board meeting with the president of one of your institutions last week, uh, and he told me that his institution is now committed to raising tuition uh, by no more than 1% above the rate of inflation. Does anybody want to admit that it's their institution? Does anybody know that this happened at your institution? Well, well anyway, okay, that's a big change. And think about what it would mean for your institution if tuition is now only going to go up by 1% more than inflation rather than the 3 to 3.5% 3 that we've been uh, increasing. Uh, financial aid uh, budgets have dramatically increased. At the margin, nationwide, private institutions give back more than 40% of new tuition dollars in, in grant aid. And actually, in the latest Nakubo uh, survey, uh, it's more in the range of 45%. Uh, and when I looked at the, uh, the data uh, in U.S. News & World Report on the financial aid policies of your institutions, I can tell you that some of your institutions are spending a lot more than 40 or 45 percent of your tuition revenue uh, on, uh, on financial aid. And the more you spend on financial aid, either to achieve the selectivity of the students you want or because you're concerned about need-based things or simply because you need to fill the seats, the less money you have to uh, actually run the institution. And uh, Nakubo uh, reports uh, in their tuition discount study each year about the increasing number of institutions that raise tuition but wind up with less money to spend than they had the year before. The third problem, and, and this problem uh, applies primarily uh, to liberal arts colleges that are actually involved in external sponsored research, uh, is that uh, the, the share of uh, money that we spend on research that comes from institutional sources has gone up. 
If you went back to 1970, the typical research university was spending 10% uh, of its uh, research budget out of its own pocket. By, 19, by 2000, that had risen to about uh, 20%, and it's continued there uh, ever since. And cutbacks in federal funding for research, which are uh, occurring, and certainly a slowdown in the rate of growth of federal funding, means that if you or the research universities want to maintain their research uh, levels, they're going to be spending more. Uh, and that, that, that's a problem, because I'm going to tell you that uh, undergraduate students bear part of the cost of the increased money that is being spent on research. And then the final problem is that, that instructional expenditures have declined uh, relative to almost everything else academic institutions do. And this is sort of true not only nationwide, but it's also true at the liberal arts colleges. Uh, and while some institutions have taken dramatic steps to reduce administrative costs, uh, these actions are not a panacea uh, and often shift cost onto uh, faculty. And we need continual efforts to reduce administrative costs and to figure out how to deliver high quality education in a cost efficient manner. Okay, so let me now talk about each of these four things in a little bit more detail. Uh, why does tuition keep uh, increasing? I, I, I uh, have been using now for uh, almost 20, <coughs> 20 years the Cookie Monster analogy, right? So Cookie Monster is the character on Sesame Street, and all he or she wants to do is to find as many cookies as he or she, uh, is it a he or a she? I don't know. He. Okay. All a Cookie Monster wants to do is to find as many cookies as he can, shove it into his mouth, and eat them. And selective private institutions are very, very similar. We want to grab as many resources as we can and use them to do really good things. We want to have the best faculty. We want to have the best facilities. Uh, we want to have the best living and learning environment. We want to have the best students, and that's where the financial aid um, uh, comes in. And, uh, and all of these things cost money. And you say, well, why do you have to raise, why do you have to raise tuition to get the money. And the answer is that perceptions by students and their parents uh, and evidence that where students go to college matter almost as much as whether they go uh, to college uh, uh, pushes people to increasingly apply to the selective private institution. So how is it that Cornell's acceptance rate has fallen from 30% to 16%? over a five or 10 year period. And I imagine in a number of your institutions, the same type of thing has happened. There are more students who are applying to our institution, partially because of the presence of the common application, which makes it, uh, uh, which makes it easier. But, but, but people understand uh, that. And, and by the way, I should say that every study which had looked at the question, does going to a selective private institution confer a unique advantage on you has found that it does in terms of postgraduate earnings and opportunities to get into high quality professional and graduate schools. There's only one study that didn't find that and that was by a little known economist named Alan Kruger and uh, he's a former undergrad student of mine so I can't say anything bad about him. So, so basically if these long lines of people are knocking at our doors then basically that there's no market pressure on us to hold, uh, hold, uh, tuition, uh, hold tuition down. Third factor is how much we spend influence our US News and World Report rankings. So uh, uh, many years ago, I did a, a study with Jim Monk, who is now at the University of uh, Richmond, which in spite of its name is a selective private uh, institution. And what we found using data on the Kofi institutions, which are a set of about 35 selective research universities and liberal arts colleges, is that when you go up in the rankings, the following things happen. More students apply, a greater fraction of them uh, accept your offers of admission, so you can accept a smaller fraction. Uh, the test scores of the entering students go up, and the amount of financial aid that you have to give to attract each student goes down, holding other things constant. And conversely, when you fall in the rankings, lots of bad things happen. 
So although uh, administrators, and there are some here uh, today, or, tell you they don't pay any attention to the rankings, they're lying. They care passionately about the rankings, and expenditure per student is an important element in the rankings. If you were unilaterally to cut your spending or to increase your spending at a slower rate than your competitors, you're going to fall in, in the ranks. So that puts pressure on us to spend more, which increases our need for uh, tuition. And finally, we keep uh, uh, investing in technology that enhances our students' experience, but that does not necessarily reduce uh, course. I, I love teaching in the tiered lecture room, which uh, I now have uh, in the college where I teach, and enables me to sort of bring in speakers uh, from uh, other places. It also allows me to teach in two different places at once, and I'll talk about that again later. But that doesn't reduce cost. Um, uh, I, uh, we keep increasing bandwidth so our students uh, can, uh, can have it. And we, uh, so, so basically we're doing all these things and we're doing them partially because our competitors are doing it. And it's part of the arms race of, uh, of spending. Okay, so why does our financial aid bills keep increasing? Well, when I, when I first got to Cornell, I was on uh, a faculty budget uh, committee um, and uh, in the late 70s, our policy was increase tuition by the amount that median family income has gone up in the previous year. So uh, if you're increasing, t and, and actually it was a little bit more specific because back in the late 70s, Cornell was a, not a national university, it was a regional university. So we were increasing tuition by this amount that median family went up uh, of families in the Northeast, New York State and Mid-Atlantic region where the head of the household was 45 to 59 because those college age uh, students. And so our tuition was constantly 28% of our median family uh, income. But we somehow we, higher education institutions, lost the discipline around 1980 to keep tuition in line with family incomes. And we began to think uh, not about what can people afford, but what do we need the, uh, the money for? Uh, today at my uh, institution, uh, tuition is about 65% of median family income. So 28 to 65%, that's a big, uh, big uh, increase. So uh, if you have financial aid policies with a given set of rules uh, for need-based financial aid, if tuition is going up more rapidly than uh, family income, that's going to increase uh, uh, your financial aid. But another thing happened, which is that uh, during a, a large part of the last 25 years, we had prolonged periods of endowment growth. And if uh, your institution's policy is to spend, and many institutions have a policy something like the following, spend four or five percent of an average of the endowment value over the last three years or the last 12 quarters. Well, if you have such a policy, and on average endowments are going up by 10 to 15 percent uh, a year, then your endowment spending uh, as, as a percentage of the current value of endowment is going to be much lower than the percentage uh, that you're using for the average. Uh, and that made people feel guilty. So they said, well, let's use the money to increase financial aid. And the richest institutions started out doing it. And once the richest institutions do that, the rest of the institutions follow to the best of their ability. And then suddenly, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, somebody, people began publishing data on the share of our students that were Pell Grant recipients. And those of us that had need-blind admissions and need-based financial aid policies and continued to brag about them uh, and pretend that we are holier than now, suddenly we didn't look very good. Because in spite of all of our, uh, all of our efforts, uh, to attract relatively low-income students, we weren't very successful uh, in doing that. So that put more pressure on us to raise our financial aid uh, policies. And then in 2007, 2008, the Senate Finance Committee started investigating institutions that had uh, endowments that exceeded one billion dollars. Uh, Somebody from Grinnell is here, so they would, they would come close to fitting, fitting there. Um, and uh, they wanted to know, why are you spending so little? 
and there were implicit threats, maybe we will treat you like we do foundations. Private foundations, such as the Mellon Foundation, which is supporting this meeting, and I have to say the Mellon Foundation uh, has supported my uh, institute since 1998, so I have a great debt of uh, gratitude to them. Private foundations have to spend at least 5% of the average of two years of endowment values, and the universities didn't want that. And so whether, uh, and the richest ones, whether uh, they did this because they were trying to forestall federal regulation or because they really sincerely believed that they had an obligation to spend more, dramatically increased their financial aid policy. So Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, eliminate all loans from financial aid policies. And those of us who didn't have as much money, we, we try to do as much as, uh, as, as we could. And of course, all of us did these things right at the point that the Great Recession hits, and the financial need of our students dramatically goes up because family incomes are down, housing assets are, uh, uh, are, are down. Um, and so, uh, uh, and, and some of you uh, who basically have to worry about filling seats, not just among all the applicants that you have, which ones will you be able to choose from, great problem. That put tremendous pressure uh, uh, on, on you. Well, there's, there's, there's a problem I've already mentioned, which is that uh, when our net tuition uh, is, uh, or our tuition discount is 40 to 45 percent, that doesn't leave a lot of money to run the rest of, of the university. But, but there's another problem, and that problem is that if you have a, uh, if you're need-based financial aid, uh, every time tuition goes up by more than family income goes up, the share of your students who are getting financial aid goes up. So at some of your institutions, the share of students receiving financial aid actually is in the 70 to 80 percent range. Uh, in my institution now, uh, it's about 51 percent. So 51 percent of our students at Cornell uh, get institutional aid, and the average grant aid they get this year is $34,000. So you said, say, well, wait a minute, we have half of the students paying full price and half of the students getting a $34,000 uh, uh, discount. Uh, and if I'm smart enough to realize that, maybe the students who are paying full price are going to eventually realize that. And that creates problems on campus. And maybe these students won't be as happy alums as previous generations of students because they're bitter that they're paying uh, uh, so, uh, so much. So th th I, I think that's a long run problem that we have to, to worry about. Now, the, the, the research uh, cost things, I, I've already told you, the share of research costs which institutions pay out of their own pockets has gone up from 10 to 20 percent. Here are the reasons, uh, reasons why. Um, and uh, I, I did a study a number of years ago with a number of, uh, of colleagues and we looked at the question, when an institution spends more, when a private institution, primarily the research universities, spend more out of their own pockets on research, who is paying for it? And what we found is that other factors held constant. When you spend more on research, your tuition goes up at a slightly higher rate, your student-faculty ratio goes up, and the share of the faculty that are uh, employed that are non-tenure track goes up. So uh, implicitly, undergraduate students at private research universities, we didn't do this for liberal arts colleges, but something you might think about. Implicitly, the, the uh, uh, undergraduate students at private research universities are bearing some of the cost of, of research, and uh, presumably there are benefits to them. I, I work with lots of undergraduate students at research, and many of you work with lots of undergraduate students on research, but in the years ahead, we have to be able to articulate better the advantages uh, of, uh, of, of this. And we have to really worry, can we continue to raise tuition uh, to, c to cover the cost of research? Okay, so uh, what I, the fourth factor I said is that uh, all of our costs have been going up at more rapid rates than in instructional uh, costs. Uh, expenditures on student service and administration, uh, I, I want to sort of focus on them uh, quickly. Uh, in other research that I've done, uh, we showed that uh, student service expenditures are not 
in merely frills, but they actually influence the persistence and graduation rates of, of students, especially for students from disadvantaged either educationally or socioeconomically background, uh, backgrounds. So I would be very careful looking ahead about thinking about cutting student service expenditures, especially if you continue to try to diversify your student body to take either more disadvantaged students or more students uh, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged or more students uh, with limited backgrounds. Why do administrative uh, costs uh, keep, uh, keep going up? Uh, administrative costs go up from the proliferation of government regulation and reporting requirements, the fact that it takes money to make money. You cannot raise money for development purposes without spending money on development and alumni uh, uh, affairs, and just the increasing complexity of our, our institutions. And then coming back to my Cookie Monster uh, example, they also arise from every unit, both non-academic ones and academic ones, trying to be as good as it can. Now, I have to be careful because I know there's at least one non-academic administrator uh, in, uh, in the room, but the example I like to use is the human resource uh, example, and, and it goes something like the following. Periodically, the uh, human resources department in my institution will commission a consulting company to do a study of peer institutions, and then we'll try to find out how much does Cornell spend on a per staff, faculty and staff member basis relative to its competitors. And they will get back, here are your 20 competitor institutions, we're not going to name them, but here is where you rank in terms of expenditure per staff member. If it turns out that you rank below the median, if that's what your, your target is, then the Vice President for Human Resources goes to the Provost and the President and said, look at all the good things I would, could do if I had more money. Uh, I could have employee assistance programs. I could have uh, retirement counseling programs so we could get rid of the senior faculty like Ehrenberg, who are really trying to get rid of. Uh, I could have uh, subsidized childcare things, which will make it easier for us to attract uh, women in STEM uh, fields. Uh, I could have staff training programs that will allow our staff members to, uh, uh, to uh, move up. I could have spousal employment support, either search support or job placement support, which is really important to us because we live uh, in a community where there's nothing else around you, which of course is the characteristic of many of your institutions uh, uh, as well. So basically, uh, all of the pressure from the non-academic side, as well as the academic side, is to spend more to be as good as, as you can. They're not evil people. They really want to be as good as, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as they can. So it's just like the problem with CEO compensation or with president's compensation. So the Board of Trustees says, we want our president to be paid at least at the 70th percentile. And the president is getting paid less than the 70th percentile, so we're going to raise the president's compensation. But everybody is, is doing that. Uh, and so as a result, the compensation of presidents goes up at more rapid rates than the compensation of faculty. I, I, I'm sorry, but I had to make my AUP colleagues uh, happy uh, with that. So th that's what goes on in the, in the corporate world uh, as, uh, as well. well. Well, the game changed. And I want to shift and sort of talk about this. The game changed after the financial collapse. And a number uh, of large universities, the first three were Cornell, Berkeley, and University of North Carolina, commissioned Bain uh, uh, Consulting, which is different than Bain Capital, so it has nothing to do with uh, Romney, to do studies of how can we reduce our administrative cost. And they got recommendations, which is reduce layers of administration, and increase the number of de direct reports, centralize procurement, do it electronically, limiting it to preferred vendors. That's a big thing. You want to get quantity discounts, and you want fewer people involved processing paper, and reorganize administrative services to achieve efficiencies and reduce costs. So for example, at Cornell, uh, every college had its own library. Every college had its own IT. Every college had its own uh, human resource 
director, not anymore. And uh, at Cornell, we have taken 6% out of our base budget. Uh, but once you do this, you, that's not going to help you keep down the future rate of tuition increase unless you take further steps to slow down the increase in costs. Now, you don't have to be a large research university uh, to do that. At, at the SUNY system, our, our chancellor has pushed hard the notion of shared services system-wide and also pairwise. So we now have a number of campuses that share vice presidents for human resources, that share uh, vice presidents, uh, chief financial officers, that share directors of, uh, of police. Typically, these are when institutions are close uh, to uh, each other. She even, our, our chancellor, wanted to share presidents, but that did not get any, uh, at, at any, uh, at any attraction. And then, of course, uh, if you're a small independent college, you can sort of do similar things through a consortium. So there are, there are some uh, institutions here which from Wisconsin, uh, and uh, three ACM members are members of the Wisconsin Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. They have a collaboration project that works to try to sh figure out ways to share back office functions. And then there's something called the Coalition for Cost Savings, uh, and seven of you belong to it. You probably don't even know that you belong to it because you belong to it because you belong to state associations which belong to this consortium, and it similarly tries to do that thing. So it's, imp it's an imperative. You have to figure out ways to reduce administrative cost so we could use the savings to support the academic efforts of the institutions without increasing tuition. But you also can collaborate to enhance academic mission and reduce cost. So if you are uh, cl in close proximity, so I, I, my, my first uh, real teaching job was at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And in Amherst, there are five, uh, in, the, in the, 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 the Valley region, Pioneer Valley, there are five colleges, Amherst College, Hampshire College, Smith College, Mount Holyoke College, and UMass. Uh, and students at any institution can take courses at any other institution, no flow of tuition. Uh, in uh, the Philadelphia area, there are three colleges, Bryn Mawr, Swarthmore, and Haverford, that similarly collaborate. Uh, and it's facilitated when you're in the same geographic uh, area if you run a bus service. So that's the cost. You have to continually run the buses between these uh, campuses. Or you can use technology. So probably 10 years ago, I started, because I have this wonderful tiered classroom with uh, uh, video conference uh, capabilities, uh, I, I, I teach a class, my economics of higher education class simultaneously to students in Ithaca and students in our Cornell and Washington uh, program. And uh, uh, all of the students in Ithaca have buttons in front of them. And if they want to speak, they raise the hand and then they push the button. And immediately they are seen on the screen in Washington as opposed to me. Uh, the, the people in Washington, we don't have great technology there. They, they just shout out. So, uh, and, and before I did it with the Cornell and Washington program, one year I taught the class jointly with what is now called Binghamton University. Because that was my uh, undergraduate alma mater. Uh, and I wanted to sort of pay them back, and I don't have a lot of money because I'm a professor, uh, so I could do it by sharing my expertise. Or uh, I taught a, a class jointly with the University of Virginia with a woman named Sarah Turner, who was teaching a similar class, but not the exact same class. We did five sessions uh, together. But there are other examples. There is a, a virtual classics department, and I, is there a classics professor here who can pronounce this? for me. I think it's Suno Kiss Yes. Whatever. I'll, I'll accept that correction. Uh, this virtual classics department was uh, initially set up by our benefactor, the Mellon Foundation. It was done by an association of liberal arts colleges in, in the South. And the basic problem was that no college had enough resources to have more than four professors of classics. Often they only had one or two. And that did not create enough uh, faculty to have very robust uh, curriculum. So 
through uh, uh, synchronous or asynchronous uh, teaching, they were able to dramatically expand the uh, curriculum uh, and to go on and, and do some of the things that your organization uh, already does in terms of the equivalence of study abroad uh, programs. Or uh, now three research universities, Columbia, Cornell, and Yale, teach less common languages. Now, less common languages just means we haven't taught them a lot in the past. In the past doesn't mean that they're small language necessarily. But currently, there are 14 languages that are joined jointly by these three institutions. Each institution has responsibility for uh, one of them via video conference over the, uh, the internet with class size limited to 12. So you don't have to lose the thing, one of the things that you are intimately concerned about, which is maintaining small class sizes to expand your curriculum without expanding uh, faculty. And then, of course, uh, there is uh, an online uh, con uh, consortium of, uh, of independent colleges and universities which uh, feed online classes in, and then anyone can take it. Uh, and uh, I know online teaching is a no-no for selective private liberal arts colleges, except again, a president of your institution told me that this summer you're launching your first collaborative online class. And, and what subject is that in? Calculus. Calculus, OK. OK, so, so there's that. And, and then, of course, once you begin thinking about that, you can sort of think about all of the technology, uh, th things that technology makes uh, possible. Uh, one thing that's in vogue is flipped classrooms. And I'm thinking here of the Carnegie Mellon University opening, uh, Open Learning Initiative. Uh, and there's been an evaluation of that by Ithaca, I-T-H-A-K-A, -A, which is a subsidiary of the Mellon Foundation. And if you go to the Ithaca webpage, you can find that evaluation. And basically, uh, they, they, they did a true experiment with statistics classes, variety of public uh, institutions. And this, uh, basically, you have primarily technology, active learning, smart tutors. And then it's hybrid, because there are professors uh, there. And uh, what they have found is that uh, you can teach this way, persistence in the class goes up, uh, student test performance is at least equal, you can get it done in a shorter period of time. There were no real cost savings initially, but that's because uh, the, the initial efforts were, this is the first time the class was, was being, being uh, uh, taught. Uh, and the National Center for Academic Transformation has lots of these uh, types, of, uh, types of things. They haven't done a lot of true experiments, but you could see the institutions that have participated in it and what the success of their efforts uh, has, has been. And then finally, there's the whole thing about, uh, about MOOCs. And uh, MOOCs, you know, different institutions are using them for different uh, purposes. Uh, my institution, uh, signed up with edX, and uh, we want to produce unique courses to show the world how great we are and to make people want to come to us. Within the SUNY system, we have signed up there with uh, course something, Coursera. Coursera. And there, we want to create classes, not necessarily large lectures. Some of these may just be purely online type things so that students at any one of our campuses who need a class to graduate can take a class at any other one of our institutions. We have 64 institutions in the SUNY system, 31 four-year colleges, number uh, 29, I think, um, two-year institutions, and then some, uh, some, some medical schools. So something like that might be a model that sort of is interest, that's of interest to you. You have to think about what type of financial arrangements can you make so that when a student takes a class at one institution, there is some compensation to that institution and that the student's financial aid 
perhaps still sticks with the student and, uh, and, 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 and so forth. Uh, I think another thing that, that you can do is you can benefit from the pressures faced by the publics. So, boy, it, I, I can tell you as a trustee of a public system, we pay, face tremendous pressure to increase enrollments and graduation rates at the same time that our funding continues to be reduced. And this has led to substantial enrollments at public two-year institutions. And so we, worf we worry a lot, how can we increase the flow of students from our two-year institutions to our four-year institutions? Well, I believe that perceptive selective private colleges should view this as an opportunity to enhance racial, ethnic, and economic diversity on your campuses, as well as to provide some financial payoff to you. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of, uh, of, of examples. Uh, Smith uh, uh, College has long had arrangements with Miami-Dade Miami College uh, in Florida. Uh, and so has the University of Wisconsin. The, the former chancellor of the University of Wisconsin basically said to me, I can't get racial ethnic diversity in Wisconsin. We all look alike. He was exaggerating a little bit. So I have to go out of state to, to get it. Uh, the Jack Ken Cook Foundation had a community college transfer initiative that has sort of pushed uh, selective private institutions to commit to taking more top students from two-year colleges. I, I don't think any of your institutions have been involved with this. My institution is, and one of the strategies that, uh, that they're uh, pursuing is a cohort strategy where you try to get a group of students from the same two-year college to come so people don't feel alone uh, and, uh, and, and left out. Uh, and then the Community College of Philadelphia has dual admission with 11 private colleges and universities. So that is to say, you get admitted both to the two-year college and the four-year college at the same time with guaranteed transfer to the four-year college if you meet certain admission uh, standards. So I think you know, your, your institution sort of should sort of think about it. How important is it? that your students are with you for four years? Do you take a lot of transfer students? At my, under, at my, my undergraduate college, uh, the School of Industrial Labor Relations, takes about 160 freshman students each year. We also take 105 or 110 transfer students, so that 45% of our new students each year are transfer students. So, so why, do we, why do we do that? Well, we've had cutbacks in state funding. We have limitations on the number of students that the university allows us to admit as, as freshmen. We desperately need the tuition revenue, and so, therefore, we take lots of transfer students. And many of these transfer students, uh, we do something like the following. We say, you know, we're sorry we, because of the constraints we have on admission, we can't let you in. But if you go elsewhere, get a B plus average in this set of classes, and do not do anything that's going to give you a disciplinary violation, you don't even have to reapply. We're going to write to you uh, in February and say, do you want to transfer here? Uh, and if you say yes and you send us the transcript and you have the average the first semester, you're in. So uh, this has kept the financial well-being of my college uh, up, uh, and it's enabled us to raise uh, salaries. Uh, and I'm in one of the public colleges at Cornell. It's enabled us to raise our salaries by 15 or 20 percent relative to the salaries of faculty on the other uh, SUNY campuses. So if you're interested in trying to achieve socioeconomic or racial ethnic diversity and you're having problems, this is a way to, to do it, and you don't have to pay for the financial aid for the students for all four years because you only have them for, for two or, uh, or, or three. Now, the, the, the publics, th there are horrible pressures that the publics are, are, are open. They're, they're, pub they're pressured to use resources more efficiently. In, in Texas, they, they actually are pushing the universities uh, to present data on the revenue generated versus the cost of each faculty member. So how many students is the person teaching? 
What does that mean in tuition revenue? What research grants has the person brought in? And what are we paying the students? Boy, that increases pressure on the publics to increase the use of, uh, of adjuncts. Well, it turns out there's been a substantial body of research uh, on the question, do tenured and tenure track faculty matter? And Jill mentioned that I did one of the early studies. Uh, and what we found is there's no such thing as a free lunch. That as the share of students, uh, the share of faculty that are full-time non-tenure track or are adjuncts goes up, other factors held constant, graduation rates go down, and first year persistent rates uh, go down. So this is, this is a real problem that the publics are gonna face. And it's an opportunity for your institutions to emphasize the quality of your product and to contrast your graduation rates with those of publics with similar student uh, profiles. Now, I have to be careful because there was a story in either the Chronicle or Inside Higher Education last week which uh, purported, I didn't look at the story, story, to show that a set of Catholic colleges had presented the results of research showing their graduation rates are higher than comparable private that are not religiously connected and public institutions. So if you're not out there bragging about your results, other people are gonna be out there trying to, uh, trying to get you. Okay, so to, uh, to conclude, uh, what, what do I think is gonna happen uh, in, in the future? Now remember, I'm not very good. Uh, well, actually, if you read my best-selling book, Tuition Rising, which is available at fine bookstores everywhere, which means you can still get it at amazon.com, you'll see that my predictions around the turn of the century of what was gonna happen for private higher education were, were fairly accurate, but, but here's, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna see modifications of financial aid policies. Uh, uh, Wesleyan uh, uh, took the bold step uh, to basically say, we cannot afford to be need blind in admissions anymore. We're gonna admit the final 10% of our students uh, with respect to their, to their need, because to do otherwise would mean that we would have to increase the loan burdens on all of our students, and we don't wanna do that, or we would have to admit the last 10% of the students say, we can't give you any grant aid, and they would take on loan burdens, which we think would just greatly hinder their ability to study what they want or even to, to complete. So some institutions are just changing fundamental uh, uh, policies, right? Uh, Grinnell, we're gonna keep doing, where is Grinnell? Yeah, we're gonna keep doing what we're doing, but we're gonna try to get more full paying students. How, how do you get more full paying students if you keep doing what you've been doing? You, you recruit more in upper income areas. Okay, well, that, well that's a conscious uh, decision. Grinnell has one of the highest tuition discount rates of any university, and Grinnell is very, very serious about wanting to have a diverse student body, but it's just that their financial aid policies have gotten uh, out of hand. And other universities are just marginally tinkering with it. So, so at Cornell this year, we increased the family income level uh, from 60 to 75,000, where we have no loans in our financial aid policy, and we marginally increase the size of loans for families whose family incomes are less than 120,000. So, so there's a problem here because there's a trade-off between the social objective of increasing educational opportunities for groups that are underrepresented in higher education and the private objective of having enough resources to have a high quality program. Boy, am I glad that I'm not a leader of a private institution now. This is a very difficult challenge which the administrators and the faculty at our institutions has to face. Uh, we have to try to enhance reven revenue from annual giving. And to do that, we have to devote more resources and to think about strategies that can be used. Uh, for those of us who have research, uh, we have to increase efforts to commercialize research funding. Why did, in, in case you don't know, Cornell won a competition to establish a new tech campus in New York City. Why would you want to have a tech campus in New York City, which is uh, a four and a half hour bus ride 
away from our main campus? And the answer is you can't do tech transfer unless there are firms around you who are going to adopt it. And when you are located in the middle of nowhere with very poor air service, there are not going to be a lot of industrial parks developed in the Ithaca area. You have to have uh, increased usage of the facilities, more summer and evening programs. Well, if, if you're in Ithaca, New York, or in many of your locations where you're the only thing within 1,000 miles, there aren't a lot of high school students coming home during the summer that are going to want to take summer school classes. So that sort of suggests, well, maybe you really do have to get involved in online education for summer programs, either for your own students or for students from other colleges. And if you're going to do that, and you, but you have to price it in a way that will make it acceptable for students from other colleges. Uh, and uh, evening programs. And, and again, if, if you're in Ithaca, it's, it's, it's very hard to think about having what type of professional master's programs can we have in the evening. So if you are thinking about expanding in that direction, which is the next thing I'm going to urge you to do, uh, presumably it would have to be largely an uh, online type of delivery or a hybrid thing where people only come to the campus uh, periodically. And we have to increase our efforts to generate revenue from full tuition paying or lower tuition discount programs, including hybrid and online. But there's real concern about protecting your brand. You don't, you don't want to do anything that's going to depreciate the value of an undergraduate degree from one of your institutions. So if, if you're going to if you're going to do this, uh, maybe it will be. Uh, we have something called the eCornell, which doesn't do degree, but it does certificates programs in certain fields that people want training in. Maybe you will do that. Or maybe you will creatively think about ways to create master's programs for your own students and maybe for other students. And for your own students, they, they will be able to get these degrees in one additional year uh, of study. So I, I was at Oberlin for a conference uh, earlier uh, this, this spring. Uh, and I wondered, you have all these students who want to be teachers. Why don't you have an MAT program where you're, you know, your student, you don't need a lot of people. Well, you need a school system which will give them student teacher experiences. And you need a couple of people who can deliver the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the classes.